Okay, we're on the air. Welcome. This is October 24th, Park and Rec meeting. Uh, general public, Herb knows the drill, but we have handouts in the back and we also have speaker cards. If you want to speak on any item, whether it's on the agenda or not, fill out a speaker card and hand it over to Tanya. Uh, we'll start with roll call. Ann Cribs. Here. Jeff Greenfield. Here. Jeff Lemire. Here. Ryan McCauley. Here. Don McDougall. David Moss. Here. Keith Rechtel. Here. Don McDougall is absent. Okay. Or late, we'll find out. Only time will tell. Uh, next, agenda changes, request deletions. Does anyone have any changes they want made? Then we'll move on to oral communications. This is oral communications for anything that is not on the agenda. I think we do have a speaker. Okay. We have two speakers. Okay. Uh, Neil Aronson, is it? Yes. Okay. Hi. Members of the commission, thank you very much for letting me speak for a few minutes. Uh, my name is Neil Aronson. I'm the director of operations and a board member at the Palo Alto Soccer Club. We are a, a 40 year old um, Palo Alto organization uh, helping develop youth uh, programs, uh, athletics through competitive soccer. Um, we were started in 1977. So this is our, so this is our 40th anniversary. So. Um, we've been around a long time helping these, uh, helping youth uh, develop soccer in the community. And um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the city, the city suffers from an acute shortage of well-maintained athletic fields. Uh, the Palo Alto Soccer Club has worked with staff and fellow youth soccer clubs over the last few years to help improve the condition and availability of city fields. However, this work has been challenging. Uh, as the condition of, of our fields have, has continued to deteriorate for a number of reasons, drought, so forth, um, while the need for fields continues to grow. Um, youth soccer, lacrosse, uh, other field sports are growing um, very uh, fast, uh, not just in Palo Alto uh, nationwide, um, and it continues to put more pressure on these fields. Uh, the Palo Alto Soccer Club has come up with an, a, a novel idea, I think, to help create some additional field availability during um, some of the most critical times of the year. Uh, right now, typically late fall and early spring when we start to lose the, the daylight and then when we, we have yet to change back to daylight savings so it's still dark in the kind of late afternoon hours. What we propose, and we're here to get a, a, a sense from you as to how we might pursue this, uh, what we propose is to try to utilize a temporary mobile lighting system powered by solar and say, and uh, that solar power is saved with batteries. So it's a solar storage solution, no emissions, no noise, um, to light the Cubberly turf field between the hours of 5 and 8.30 p.m. Um, the units that we're looking at are considered about, are, are, are considering, I should say, are about the length and width of a food truck give you some context. And they have two light towers, approximately 20 feet tall with LED lights on each end. Um, our hope is to test this concept during the month of February. And the reason we're looking at February is for a number of reasons. One, we start to practice again after the holiday break. Fall season is coming to a conclusion here in about a month at the end of November. We take a break for December, part of January, teams start up again typically in mid-January, February. Um, and so that's an important window for teams to get up to speed and begin to, to be prepared for the season. Uh, we realize that using lights on the Cubberly turf field can create some concern for neighbors. Um, and we're very sensitive to that. Obviously Cubberly is, is, well, maybe it's not obvious. Cubberly is our home fields, if you will. We spend a lot of time out there. We know a lot of the neighbors. We know a lot of the issues that go on. We try to have good rapport with the neighbors. Um, we've already started a little bit of an informal outreach um, by contacting some of the immediate neighbors right behind the Cubberly turf fields uh, to see if this would even be something they would entertain. And surprisingly, we've had some reasonable feedback. Nobody's, nobody's come out and said, no way. Um, 
And so uh, what we'd like to do, um, and of course, as part of this effort, we would accelerate our outreach if, if there's some direction from the commissioner staff that this proposal might be considered. Um, so we would continue that outreach and really try to get a, 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 and probably work with the city to get a very good sense of what the community thinks of, of this idea as a, as a temporary solution. Um, we hope you will consider our request and maybe provide us with some timely direction as how we might advance this proposal. Um, get it reviewed and approved within the city's process by January, if possible. Uh, as a general note, I did take this idea to um, staff first, and they didn't really know what to do with it. So that's why I'm here. So I realize you can't respond to me, but perhaps through back channels, you can uh, communicate to us as to how we might proceed with this idea. And again, temporary, one time, want to see how it works in February. If it works, of course, we would probably be interested in doing it again, but that's what we're looking for right now. Thank you very much. I have some questions for Darren and Kristen. So how would this work if they want to pursue this? Would they have to go to staff and get it on the agenda for next month? Or how, what would be the process for? Yeah, I believe that we would work with staff um, if there was some guidance from the commission that this is something worth interesting, a policy you'd like to be considering. Um, suggest staff work with uh, the soccer groups and come up with some ideas on how we can make this work and then bring it to the commission for some policy input mm -hmm. and ultimately public outreach and go from there. Uh, me personally, I would, be, I would support that. I like a trial project. If it doesn't work out, you haven't lost much. And if it does work out, the community benefits. So I think it would be worth pursuing. I can't speak for the rest of the commission. Uh, I have a question. Do you think, as, as far as the commission uh, assisting staff with this, do you think this would fall under the the liaison role with the turf management? And, and, and Neil is, is, is one of the, the stakeholders uh, who we've been working with for many years. Or would this uh, fit under the uh, field, court, uh, facility policy group? That's good. I think um, this would fit under probably the field use policy um, ad hoc. Thank you. I, I know that that ad hoc is busy, but it, this is a kind of a, a, a timely uh, issue for the, for, the, for the soccer group since they're aiming for a, a February window and, and maybe not uh, su super time consuming. So I'd, I'd like to recommend that we figure out a way to, to look into it further. Um, the only other area that should be looked at is uh, the traffic patterns on Nelson in the dark. It uh, can be very, very busy. Uh, in, and uh, in the dark, it's going to be a lot worse. So if there's some way that they could use the parking lot instead of Nelson uh, during those hours, uh, maybe you want to get, I don't know, the uh, planning and transportation input on that. I just want to echo my support for trying to do this and doing a pilot project and seeing if we can move fairly quickly on it. Thank you very much. Since everyone's chiming in, I'll <laughs> put in my two cents. So I agree. I support it as well. I think it seems like a, a good uh, pilot to try out, certainly. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not there's actually any restriction presently on people using the fields. I appreciate that you know they want to have a temporary structure essentially that would provide light. But you know, if someone wanted to go to the couple of fields right now at 8.30 at night in February, there'd not be any restriction on doing that, right? It's, it's certainly within the park's hours. That's correct. Okay. Although it's not parkland, but yes. I, my understanding is that the hours of the facility aren't, aren't necessarily closing with sunset. Right, okay. Um, so then I guess just give some targeted thought to what role the commission would have if it's, you know, um, some sort of uh, particular approval of having the temporary lighting structure or, or what it was, would be that we would do. But it seems as though you don't need an amendment to any sort of existing rules. No, I think it's a policy one and just recognizing the fact that lighting in general is sensitive, especially in new facility and where there's such close proximity to residents. And this is certainly something that we would especially given our previous situation at Coverly where we were 
forced into a situation where we rush the public process. This is when we would not rush. We would take our time, make sure we got the buy-in. And I've had the privilege of speaking with um, Neil about this a little bit too, and uh, some of the staff that worked with Neil rather. And so um, I, I'd be glad to help make this happen, work on it. And this would not need council approval. Uh, my hunch is it would just need uh, policy direction from the PRC, but I'm not sure. Maybe we flush that one out some more. Okay. So I think it'd be appropriate for the field use to get together, the ad hoc, mm -hmm. and uh, work with Darren on that and see if we can get it on one of the upcoming agendas. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you, Neil. Uh, Monica Williams, you are up next. Hello, I'm Monica Williams, uh, Monica Engel Williams. My heart is in Palo Alto, having lived here for 25 years, but I now live in Mountain View. I am president of the Silicon Valley Pickleball Club and ambassador for the local area of the USA Pickleball Association. And I'm here tonight to represent our Mitchell Park Pickleball Group and would like to give you a brief update. We only recently founded our nonprofit club, and our mission is to provide a place for people to gather and enjoy low impact exercise, social and emotional health, and camaraderie for all ages and abilities. As of today, we have 317 members. Pickleball has brought new meaning to life for some of our players who are suffering from disabilities, such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and muscular dystrophy. Not to mention new shoulder, hip, and knee replacements. We have a new name for tennis courts five, six, and seven, the magical pickleball playground. <laughs> this facility is ideal, an ideal location because there are no residents nearby to be disturbed. The noise factor is imperative to address when deciding a location for pickleball. The recommended distance from a residence is 300 feet, and Mitchell Park fills the bill. Unlike most other sports, pickleball is easy to learn and inexpensive to play. We're now reaching out to teenagers and youth, the local youth in our community, to find ways to include them in a pickleball program. We have a host of volunteers that are only too willing to teach our youth we just need to find the best way to offer the program. I personally have taught pickleball on a volunteer basis for the past three seasons through Palo Alto Recreation Department, and the class is full with a maximum of 30 attendees. We're proud to be hosting the Bay Area Senior Games again in May, and I believe pickleball had more entries last year than any other event. We have been keeping data on the number of people who play pickleball in Mitchell Park. The average for each weekday is 38. The average for Saturdays is 76. And the, for Sundays, the average is 65 people. For a total of 330 players every week. All of this on only three tennis courts. Last but not least, we are very excited that the mayor and the Palo Alto City Council will be presenting our group with the honor of a proclamation on, in November for bringing pickleball to Palo Alto and in recognition of the health and wellness pickleball provides to the Palo Alto community. Thank you all for your support and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. We appreciate you working. We like it when people use the parks. It's always good. Okay, next uh, department report. Good evening, Darren Anderson, Open Space Parks and Golf. I'll give you a couple quick updates. Um, Chair Rechtal had sent me an email asking for a few items, and I'd be glad to pass that information on to the full commission. Uh, the first one was about the closed trails up at Foothills Park and where we're at with that process of trying to get them open again. Uh, so this is just a quick recap. Last winter's storms caused a tremendous amount of damage to the trails up at Foothills Park. Staff was able to correct most of them, 
but not on Los Trancos Trail. There was a significant section about three miles that are currently closed, all due to that storm damage, specifically the areas closest to the creek, and also on Costa Noan Trail, also very close to the creek, and that one's about 0.83 miles. So the actions the city took is we hired a geologist to walk the site with staff and give us an analysis of this. Um, can we fix it as is, or is this landslide as we see it? Um, too pronounced to fix it in the same location. We also brought a trail builder for his perspective too. And the consensus between the two was that those trails need to be rerouted, at least small portions of them. And I had our, our trail contractor lay out a proposed route for where those trails could go. And he said, yes, I can build this. Here's the route you would take. I've positioned it in such a way that I think this will hold up far better than the rains than your previous trails alignments did. Um, from there, we went to contact Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District. They're kind of a partner organization that build their own trails and do lots of new trail building, reroutes, that kind of thing to get advice. Their guidance was that we are going to need environmental review. It's not something you can just go in and make that kind of change, unfortunately. The city hired an environmental consultant to give us some guidance on how to go about this, and the consensus was that we should do uh, biological and cultural assessment of that proposed trail route where we want to send this reroute through. Um, they would do that. Actually, it's happening tomorrow. So I'll go up with the biologist and we'll hike through the poison oak and, and other stuff through this reroute section. We'll find a, a good trail um, and see if there's any cultural or biological things that would cause us to shift it and move it over a little bit. Um, hopefully it's in the right place and we aren't hitting anything sensitive. At that point, once we've completed that assessment, we would use the information to realign those trail reroutes if there is some information. If not, we'll stick with that. And then we have to do the CEQA analysis. Um, so that same consultant will give us a, a price. We'll probably have to hire, um, sorry, go out to bid for two more. Um, we'll take that information. Once we get through the CEQA and have our environmental approvals, we hire the contractor to do this work and we'll get it built. Um, it's tough to give me uh, the ETA that I know you want. The challenge is I don't know how long the sequel would take. I asked for a crude estimate on what she thought. She said it could take somewhere between three to six months for the sequel analysis. Um, I don't know whether that's optimistic or not, to tell you the truth. We'll see. So that's can, the trail can, situation. Can yeah. we build the trails any time of year, or do we want to? No, there'll be, there'll be times where we can't. Probably not in the rainy season where you can't get up there. It'll be too slick. Okay, so most likely next summer. I think so. Yeah. Uh, there was also a question regarding the Foothills uh, fire mitigation update, where we are with the Foothills fire management plan. So this plan's been in place for since 2001 when we got it done, but it took us a while to start implementing it, mainly because we didn't have enough funding and staff to manage it. Um, and I think the question is a very poignant one given everything that's gone on in our state with wildfires and where we're at. I'm very pleased to say thanks to great cooperation with other departments, namely Public Works, Urban Forestry, Fire Department, and in our department, uh, especially the Rangers have worked cooperatively and as a team to manage this, um, this fire concern. Um, we, you asked if there was a CIP. There's no longer a CIP. It's now funded through the department's operating budgets and pulling the money from all three departments, it's $181,000 per year. But we've taken that money and leveraged far more than we ever would have been able to do it with um, individual contractors. And we've done it through a partnership with the Santa Clara um, Fire Safe Council. And this organization, um, essentially, we're in a partnership and agreement with them. We funnel the money through them, and they hire out subcontractors, including Cal Fire uh, crews that work for very cheap and get a great amount of work done. So let me tell you just a little bit about we've, what we've got done over the last five years. It's been um, ambitious, uh, and we're really pleased with the improvements. This is above and beyond the annual mowing and disking um, and periodic treatments of Trapper Trail that was kind of part of our regular operation forever. This is above and beyond that. Uh, the areas we really focused on were evacuation routes. That's the core um, part of the fire management plan. So there's within the city boundaries on public roads, Pearson Rastadero Road, Page Mill Road and Los Trancos Road, and then the evacuation routes within the park itself, which are your Wild Horse Valley leading to Toll Camp, um, the Foothills Park maintenance yard to the gate, and Foothills Park to this Hewlett property. We also worked on prescribed fire and associated containment lines, residential boundary treatments doing disking and mowing. And as a result of the work we've put into this fire plan, there's been several benefits. And I'd say the most important is that increased ease of evacuation and emergency access. 
through that roadside vegetation work that we've done. The roadsides along those roads I talked about, Rastadero, Los Trancos, and Page Mill are all safer for access and egress. Thanks to this work, there's increased line of sight, reduced fuel loads and volumes and reduction of ladder fuels. Ladder fuels are the ones that lead up to the canopy of trees and cause the big fires that will cross over roads. Uh, the probability of ignitions has been reduced through reduction of fuels near barbecues, structures along roadsides. So this is all inside the park elements. This is where the CSD portion of the budget goes towards, where the inside the park element. Public Works does the roadside, so that's the, the page mill. And then fire is uh, responsible for contributing towards our um, prescribed fires and or other analysis. We can use that extra budget money for other work too, depending on what's, uh, what's um, needed. We have done the prescribed burn at Pearson and Rastadero. We haven't in a while, and we've talked to fire. We check in every year to see where they're at, and it's a combination of either weather, staffing, and other issues, whether we can do one. And if we don't, we do other things. And in light of the fact that we weren't able to do this one, we've been discussing using other techniques like goats and sheep, for example, to come in and graze those same areas that we might have burned. And so, yeah, we're very pleased with the uh, the work we've done on. There was another question about what do we do with the Baylands? Is that covered in this plan? It's not. The Baylands are handled separately between the fire department and open space rangers, but it's not part of that, that plan. The fire risk there is relatively low because it's mostly salt marsh, but we do manage um, rural weeds in upland areas through basically the same techniques, regular mowing when, when necessary. Uh, there was a question. Yes, sir. So the barbecues in Foothill Park I noticed uh, that there are barbecues at almost every site, even the more obscure ones uh, on, the, on the way down to the, to the uh, below the dam. And I was wondering, do you have to have barbecues at each and every site? Because yeah, some are, of those are pretty, uh, they're not the same as the, the, the oak uh, grove and the, uh, the one near the bathrooms. down. It, yeah, there are some on that roadway as you come down from the, the lake towards the interpretive center that are up on a fairly steep embankment. They, they were once larger. When I first started, they were almost double the size, and we've reduced them because they don't get used. You know, they're way back up the hill. They're really inaccessible. Um, there's still occasionally people that use them, so we've maintained them. Um, and it does, when there's over um, use in some of our, like Oak Grove or Orchard Glen, it's nice to have that alternatives. So on really busy days, there's families that use them. But um, your question was, do we need them? I, no, do one. we need the barbecues there? Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you don't need, I, I don't think you need the barbecues at yeah. each and every one of those sites. Yeah. Keep them, keep the barbecues down there at the orchard. And, and just uh, have picnic oh, tables yeah. instead. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. And it makes the roadside, the, the clearing work that's necessary for that area perhaps reduced a little bit. That's a good question. Um, there was another question about the Baylands Boardwalk. So you were presented with that information. And the question was, are we going to council or are they holding off on that? This is Public Works leading this. This is the Baylands Boardwalk project. They are going to go ahead. Uh, they had ARB review on the 19th of October. And they'll go um, back to the commission here in November, so next month they'll come to you with an update. It won't be an action item, it's an informational update, and then on to council in December. Um, I have good news about a different project, the dog park project at Piers, uh, where we last left off, I was gonna go through that potentially long wait through the planning process, and the good news is we've got staff level review and approval for the design at Piers Park, so that's great, uh, really exciting. There's a two week um, public review period, but after that, we should be good to go. So the next step in the process is November. I'll come here with the park improvement ordinance asking for your recommendation. December, we'd go to council. We'll go out to bid and hopefully build this thing as soon as we can. Um, the CIP process, this is the capital improvement um, plan. And again, that's a five-year cycle of planning for projects over $50,000, usually like building something. Um, we're having a staff kickoff meeting on November 1st, and then Chair Rechtal and I will get together and start discussing it, and we'll report back to the commission on the status of that. Uh, the Cubbly bleachers, um, you may know that 
there were two very large bleachers on either side of the synthetic turf field, both in bad condition. The worst of the two was replaced with two smaller units about two months ago, approximately. Unfortunately, the, the larger remaining one is in very poor condition and now unsafe and had to be closed. So we've got fence around that with signs that explains the why and, and the what and the how. Um, the when piece is we're gonna repair it. In about three to four weeks, we're buying the materials, and we're hiring a contractor to help staff. We'll put new wood on, and reattach it safely. And once it's safe, we'll open it right back up. Again, approximately a month. And that's my report. Any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question on, on the first item uh, on the Foothill Spark trail closures. Is the website updated with some, some information kind of giving people an idea that it's not gonna be open for six, nine, 12 months or so, something to set expectations appropriately? Yeah, thank you, good question. Uh, so we, we didn't do a very good job, and I have to own that entirely, of getting the message out to where we were. And so right now I've got staff updated, everyone's sending the same message in the open space staff to everyone who visits the park and the entrance on weekends. So all the rangers are aware. Um, we've updated the signage on the signs themselves, and the next step is to get the website updated. So we're working on the language and having the right map that's up posted there. So that will be up very soon. That's great because you, you guys have been working really hard on it and put, putting in a lot of effort and you should, you should get credit for it. Oh, thanks very much. Um, as far as the uh, bleachers are concerned, um, I had asked you earlier if the big bleacher could or should be re re um, reduced in size and you had said that there were several uh, uh, user groups using the parks that um, like it as big as it is, because obviously if you don't need it as big, you have more room for other things. Um, uh, so can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I wasn't the direct recipient of those responses, that was through our recreation staff, but I had said, we've just had this back and forth with the, the staff that um, either manage the recreation activities, the soccer groups and other field users, as well as Coverly, the facility itself. And I just said, well, what, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Um, especially in light of the fact that we've already transitioned from one large one to small, is that okay? Um, because we were getting preliminary uh, estimates back on replacing the whole structure that were extraordinarily expensive, $300,000 plus. And so we were looking at options. Can we get rid of it for some smaller, less expensive ones? Um, and then we were told that it's still used and a lot of the feedback was um, we like having it A, for exercise and B, because they're running the steps. And then secondarily, um, or perhaps primarily, for events, they have sometimes crowds that are larger that like to have the space of those large bleachers to watch. I have to say that that's still qualitative and not quantitative. I, I don't know if we have any way of measuring it or whatever, but I'm, I'm concerned that, it, that people want to run steps. That'd be a very small uh, set of stairs. <laughs> yeah, I, unfortunately, I think the, it's probably the cheapest route is to repair it rather than demoing that thing and putting in two smaller ones. The structure on that big one is still solid and good. Foundation's great. Metal's still robust. It's just the wooden planks. So believe it or not, it's cheaper to, to rehab it and you have the option of having a larger bleacher if you ever wanted a bigger event out there. But, but a fair enough question, you know, we, and given that I can get it fixed for around $10,000 or so, it seemed to make sense to, to move ahead. Yeah, let, it, let, let us know how to help. And <laughs> I was gonna say that those, uh, the people running the bleachers, they're, they're there a lot, uh, and they do use both, both aisles, uh, but I was concerned more because I uh, live right behind it, and um, there's not very few events that have more than maybe 50 or 60 people, and that was the only reason I brought that up. But I guess there have been one or two events where they've had a lot more, and I suspect that there aren't that many fields that are that big, and so if we did want to have a big event, that would be the place to have it. So. Um, anyway. One more thing about the trails. Funding is not arranged yet for the trail construction. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm sorry I didn't bring that up. Um, staff just did a little more research and I think we will be able to fund those. Both oh, the internal. construction and the CEQA. Obviously the cultural and biological assessment that are happening tomorrow are already funded. 
Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise I was going to suggest, uh, can we get it in the CIP? Yeah. It'd be a new, so we'd have to displace something, but that timing for the CIP would be out right since yeah. we won't be starting at least construction until summer. Right. And what I think I'll do is if I, if we see that what my plan is doesn't work or for some reason I'm going to be short or the, the price quotes for the CEQA come higher than anticipated, that's probably what we do is ask for a, a one-time increase for the CIP that funds trails okay. and just ask for whatever is necessary. But I believe we will be able to make it. Okay. That's good news because those are great trails. Yeah. I missed them. I was up there last weekend and there was a contractor clearing Los Trancos Trail uh, like from uh, just above Costanea up to the uh, road, doing a very nice job. Clean. There's a lot of overgrowth there. So, okay. Any other questions for Darren? Okay, Kristen, do you have anything to add? Okay. Then we move on. Uh, new business. The first is approval of draft minutes. Does anyone have any questions or comments they want for the minutes? If not, can I have a a motion? Okay. Do we have a second? We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, approved. Uh, next, uh, this is a very important item. Uh, the funding for the master plan. I was looking through this. It did a very nice job in a very short period of time. So good job. Go ahead. Uh, you'll be doing the presentation. Yeah, thank you. I'm Kristen O'Kane, Community Services. So. I'm going to share with you the status of what's a very preliminary analysis of potential funding opportunities for the master plan. And the reason we decided to bring this to you tonight in its very preliminary form is um, because of the council direction from the September 11th council meeting in which council directed the commission to explore funding options to fund the master plan, including a possible ballot initiative. Um, so staff and the PRC a master plan funding ad hoc met a few times to discuss this topic. And um, what we did is we looked at what are the high priority projects and programs in the master plan, which are included in chapter five of the master plan. and we did two things. Um, the first is in the um, spreadsheet that you have included in your staff report is we took the um, estimates that were included in chapter five of the master plan. So they were categorized as either having one dollar sign, two, three, or four. And we just translated those into the dollars that they represent. So the estimates that are in the spreadsheet isn't anything really new. Um, it's just taken from the master plan. And they're very, like I said, preliminary. They aren't based on a specific cost breakdown of what one of these projects would cost. Um, and then we also looked at potential um, timeline, also based on the master plan. We then took it a step further. And I will say that the ad hoc has not weighed in on this portion of the spreadsheet, but we looked at possible funding opportunities for different priorities, um, priority projects and programs. And the different types of funding opportunities we looked at was the first is the new tax revenue. Um, and there's different types of tax revenues that could be generated. Um, these would require a ballot measure. Um, and um, there is a brief description in the staff report on those different types of um, taxes that we could be um, a source of new revenue. But there, we would have to do quite a bit more research to really dig deep into what we could um, what would be the best new revenue source for the master plan. Um, the second is to look at the existing or to use existing capital improvement funds and um, operating budget sources. Um, really, every project will require some level of funding from the um, from the general fund or the capital improvement fund. Um, it could just be staff resources, but there will always be something from there. Um, one thing that I will say that we, um, or I failed to include in the staff report 
are the park development impact fees, the community center impact fees, and the parkland dedication ordinance fees. Um, we do have existing funds from collection of those fees. Um, some are already allocated for some projects, but there are funds that exist. Um, so those would be included in the existing um, revenue or existing funds. Do you happen to know roughly how much do we have? I do. So the current park impact fee account balance is 3.9 million and the parkland dedication ordinance fund, which is the Quimby Act um, fund is 3.2 million. And there are certain restrictions on how and where these funds can be used. Um, so we would have to carefully look at those as we would wanna use those funds to fund the master plan. Um, the next would be, we categorized as donations, which would be, could be a capital campaign, which is what the junior museum and zoo did to um, raise their funds for the new zoo facility. Um, there's also public private partnerships um, and also the parks and rec, I mean, I'm sorry, the Palo Alto Recreation Foundation and the Friends of the Palo Alto Parks, also our nonprofit partners who have provided um, support to us through the years. We would hopefully continue to um, work with them for funding options. And then also grants, there's always grants particularly related to like environmental enhancements, restorations, um, all-inclusive playgrounds, things like that. So these are the different funding um, options that we um, looked at and what we tried to do is to, um, assign to each of the high priority projects and programs what could be a likely funding opportunity for those. Um, so I again wanna mention that this is very preliminary. preliminary. It's sort of to start the dialogue to get us to a point where um, we can present to council and ask council direction on how we would like to proceed. Uh, Chris, I have a quick question just to sure. reference back to the existing fees. And those are fees that are currently being charged and will be charged to in the foreseeable future, parcel taxes or whatever those may be that are going into those funds. Is that is that correct? Or is there, is there a time limit that at some point this fund will, it'll, funds will stop uh, flowing into it. So you're referring to the impact fees and the parkland dedication fees. So the park development impact fees and the community center impact fees, those are fees that are imposed on non-residential development. So as long as there's development within Palo Alto, those um, fees would be charged. And the, um, Likewise, the Parkland Dedication Ordinance or Quimby Act fees, those are for residential subdivisions. So it, it would depend on the amount of development that's occurring in Palo Alto. Um, I, um, this is great, a great list, and um, I look forward to um, going through those right four columns because um, what you've listed is um, possible sources, but I suspect that there are best sources for each of these, like enhanced seating and parks. You would not burden a, a ballot measure with that level, and you would probably go for you know, donations or existing CIP or possibly, or, or the same thing with exceeding ADA requirements. You might go with a grant would be the best possible. So I look forward to sort of uh, playing with that um, because this is really uh, exciting. And if I thought that everything had to be done with a ballot measure, it would be de quite demoralizing. But the fact that there are these other areas uh, is, is really, um, I, I like that. Yeah, so we, this actually is a great start, so thank you very much for all of this. Um, we talked about how much the master plan could possibly cost, and so I just wanna make sure that I'm clear. So the low estimate for implementation is the 25 million. Is that, am I reading that right? I mean, I know it's just a, just a number, right? And the um, high is 95 million? That's correct. And um, very preliminary estimates. 
And so as we look at Coverly, there's, that's just the plan to plan what we're gonna do with Coverly, is that right? Well, it's the, it says plan, design, and redevelop. So it's, Coverly is sort of a, um, I think its own, I, I almost feel like it sh should be maybe not in this list and have its own category just because of the size and scope and because we don't know what the size and scope is. Um, so, so I think we don't do the master plan without Coverly, but if there's a way to call that out and just on this list and talk about how it's a special project or something, I don't, I'm I agree. not sure. And yeah. then the other two high and low estimates are the um, ongoing cost of main maintenance and um, funding to make sure we take care of everything. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Okay. I think that's all for now. And I'd like to add to that. I. I didn't include um, estimates for the programs, partly because number one, it's difficult to estimate um, implementing a program, but also uh, some of the programs could be um, completed through reallocation of staff priorities um, or you know making minor changes to some things that we're already doing now to accomplish those, so to tie um, an implementation cost on those is a little difficult. Um, but if, if we need to do that, we could try to um, spend a little bit more time trying to estimate that, but it, a lot of it is staff resources. I mean, I think before you go to council, you'd at least want some rough numbers. Now, like this, you're only a factor of four between low and high, that's not bad. In, in the tech industry, a factor of four is really tight. <laughs> this is, uh, this is pretty good estimate. Although, for example, when I look at Coverly, yeah, it, Coverly. yeah but the, the low uh, is one million for Coverly. I don't think we could, you might want to bump that one up to five million on the Coverly uh, community okay. center. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't be able to do very much for a million there, but, uh, but anyway, I'll go up to Jeff. Sure. Uh, a, a question regarding the ongoing cost, is that, intended to be incremental beyond what's already spent, or is this the total number that would be, that we would be spent? For example, for the first uh, one, it, it enhance the existing sport fields. We obviously have money in the budget now to maintain the sports fields. Um, and if we put money in to enhance them, uh, then is the ongoing cost the additional money that you would anticipate spending to enhance them, or have you given that any thought? Uh, that's a great question, and I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Um, what we will do is get a better cost estimates for all of these, and then we'll make a notation whether this is in addition to what we currently have budgeted or included. Um, my initial guess is this is in addition, yeah. um, just because this is looking at funding that we would need in the future that we don't already have. Um, so that's my initial um, response, but again, we'll look more deeply into that and we'll make a notation. And, and maybe it would be helpful to have another column that would be the total amount that you would be spending for, sp spending on, on, on something which would include what's, t what's typically in a CIP currently and then what the uh, increase would be, something to provide the information. Obviously, some of these, some of these areas won't, the, the current number will be zero, but uh, other items it won't be. Um, and ju just a little specific input on, uh, again, on the, on the first item on the sport fields, uh, there is money in the current uh, budget for a study and it's actually, and, and uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, we, we had a meeting with the, with the field, soccer field user group this, this month and with, with Darren and, and staff. And so that, that study is going on in 2018, in fiscal 2018. And uh, there's hope that there could be some implementation in, in 2019 instead of 2020. But. So I, I don't know if you're looking for feedback on, on, on specific numbers. Uh, the, the, high, the, low, the numbers are probably pretty low on, on, that, on that light on, as well. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say it's a great start uh, for, for this and as being part of the ad hoc with this, we're excited to continue the dialogue and it's great to see where, you know, how far we've come with it and, and somewhat short period of time, but to continue to push this and continue to 
do what we can and, and please, uh, if there is feedback you need from us or anything that you would need to continue to um, fast track this or just get this, get this going. And I know the city council is pressuring us a little bit with some decisions, but I, I think this is um, a great template to begin with and, and we'll certainly provide you the feedback needed to really get things moving uh, with it. So thank you very much for, for working with us on this. Thank you for your work that you did on it as well. And I will say that I think for what I would like to do for our next steps is um, get some more detail on here on this spreadsheet, meet with the ad hoc again, and then possibly come back here to the commission in November with an, a more um, a greater idea of what we would like to present to council and I'm trying to get a council date for December of this year. So we are trying to, since this is, you know, sort of fresh on their minds, they just adopted the master plan that we go back to council relatively quickly. So it's going to be a very tight time frame, but I'm hopeful that we can present something to council in December. I don't think council wanted a perfect answer. I think they wanted some just preliminary numbers. I think what you're having here is going to be what they want and they can direct you to get better numbers or they may direct you to do other things but at least we get back there quickly so they still have their options open okay and I want to make sure that the Commission is comfortable with what we're presenting as well since it was really you know a direction to the Commission so mm -hmm. I want you all to be comfortable with that yeah. the, the formats great okay, Don, go ahead. so I got really carried away <laughs> Um, I actually, I actually did exactly what you were talking about. In fact, just prove you I was thinking about it. I have a column for fees because I knew that I guess that fees were probably missing. Um, and I, I understand your numbers are random numbers, not quite random, but I, I understand that. And therefore, mine are similar, but but they're all scalable. So if 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 you adjust your numbers, I could I could adjust these numbers. Then what I tried to do is say, if I was on council, because I don't think council wants us to just come and give them a bunch of numbers. My guess is the council also expects a strategy. And so in that, I, my first question was, were there things missing? Uh, the, I forget what we call it now, but the former ITT facility uh, doesn't seem to be on the list, but it is in the master plan. And I don't know if there's other things that were missing. And I. You can worry about that later. The other thing I did is I looked at this in terms of the total numbers that came out just on an average and then tried to guess what, and I don't even know how I could guess, but guess what the appetite might be uh, for some sort of bond measure. And the two numbers that jumped out, uh, I ended up saying I, with, that I had a tax one and a tax two plan, uh, to use your terminology, because I think uh, both the gymnasium and purchase of new land stand out in a way that they could crater a bond measure. Uh, because the other thing, the next item on our agenda is the use fees and, and so on and, and the categories of, of, uh, of usage. And it seemed to me that one of the other columns that could be added here is which of those fee categories does it fall, does it fall into not because we're worried about collecting the fees, but because it tells us something about the nature of the, of the item on here. Is it all, is it totally public benefit or is it, is it private benefit? Uh, and that would tell you also how much uh, bond measure funding you might want to pursue versus how much outside funding you might want to pursue. Um, but as when I did that, the, the gymnasium and the, and the new land I worried about those being things, everything else on the list, I don't think anybody would argue with. I think those two things are risk the whole, the whole project. Um, but I wanna echo, I, I think you did a spectacular job and it was great fodder for, for playing with and you probably don't want me to share this with you but I'll share it with you anyway. <laughs> oh, please do, I would like to see it. Okay, so I'll try to be quick. Um, first off, I think that the plan that you just proposed is exactly right. You need to go back and work with the ad hoc. Um, and so these thoughts that I have are really kind of designed to help inform that process potentially. So um, 
appreciating Keith's comment, I actually think that the delta between the high and low estimates on implementation is problematic. Um, I think you need to have um, a much closer range. And um, just looking at these numbers, the low estimates to me seem pretty unrealistic. Perhaps the high estimates are actually close to what we think is going to be the real cost, but I think you need to have a tighter range. Um, so anything you can do to you know, improve what you think that, that range will be, I think is going to be beneficial. Um, second, the implementation timing. You know, we have all of these running through 2038, and I think that if you can be more um, detailed as to when you think these things might actually take place or ideally would take place, that would also be helpful. Um, the third comment is that within our listing, I don't think that there's a prioritization. And so I think it might be helpful for the ad hoc committee to give thought to what should the prioritization of these different projects be. And maybe it's going to be that, you know, some of the short-term projects are the top priority, followed by what we think are the most feasible long-term projects. But I think that it would be helpful to actually have a prioritized list. Thank you. That's all very good feedback. So we'll, we'll look at that with the ad hoc and with staff as well. I want to echo the ITT. I mean, if we want to refurbish that ITT land, that's going to be very expensive. The way that the, the, we'd have to pipe water in from the bay if we want that to be a saltwater marsh. And there is a pipe already, but it, there still needs to be a lot of work to, to refurb that. Um, development has really cut that off, and so we have, there's going to be a lot of work on that. Um, the numbers, yeah, I, I believe, I don't think you can get um, any closer than a factor of four just because there's so much uncertainty on the scope. I am nervous that our low estimates are way too low and our high estimates are also low. Uh, there's the scope, for example, uh, constructing the restrooms. It'd be nice if you could specify, you know, is this one restroom, 10 restrooms? How many restrooms do we have for here? And this is so tight that these are just wrong guesses, but still, it'd be nice to have some type of basis for these as opposed to guessing. Um, the, the small ones I don't think are important, but for example, the, any of the large ones, like gymnasium, can we scrub that, the, some of the big ticket items, can we scrub that and have a more realistic estimate on that? Uh, I don't know how to do that. Do we know of other cities that made gymnasiums and we can research what they spent on that? So if we had some, the big ones, the top five are the ones that are driving the total number. The ones down below, they, they're not, you know, dog parks are not gonna drive the total bill. So if we can have some realism on scrubbing numbers just for the big ticket items, I think that would be good. And same for programs. If we can have some guess of the cost of programs, that would be good. Because so what the council is going to want to look at is say, how much is this going to cost and what are our funding options? And so now when they're comparing the funding options, the impact fees, the fees numbers that you have, that's very useful. New tax revenues. Is there any way to bound each of these uh, buckets? New tax revenues is. Uh, can we give a reference for what the libraries did? The libraries earned this much, just to give them a, a ballpark number of what what would be feasible. Um, CIP or operating budget. Could we cite? what our current budget is and say that's for reference. So when they're looking at these columns, they know that, okay, this is can only be at so large. Donations, what are the friends of Palatal Parks, how many donations did they get last year? Now, if some big donor gives a large amount, that number certainly could go up, but at least gives them an, an estimate of, of where to start. Uh, grants, I have no idea what kind of size grants. I assume that they're all fairly small grants, but if we could size each of the buckets, that would be big thing but otherwise it looks really good uh, the council wanted us to work on this with a sense of urgency and I think we've done that I think we want to go to them and give them preliminary numbers and let them iterate so does anyone have follow-ups okay so ad hoc will work next month and then we'll come back next month with an update and hopefully then in December we go to council yep that's the plan okay okay thank you thank you
Okay. Sorry. I was <laughs> distracted here. Okay, next we'll be moving on to uh, the audit status report. Jasmine is here to talk about that. Good evening. So I'd like to um, welcome Jasmine LeBlanc back to the Parks and Rec Commission meeting. She's going to be presenting um, the status of the Community Services Department's fee audit report and recommendations that came out of that report. I'm Jasmine LeBlanc with the Community Services Department. Um, so this is a status update for the implementation of our recommendations in the fee schedule audit. Um, a little bit of background on this audit. It was issued earlier this year in February. Uh, they had an objective to determine if our fees cover the cost of services provided as expected. And what they mean by as expected is that um, we have a sustainable funding source that we're being kind of fiscally responsible and um, trying to make sure that there's equity in how we charge residents and non-residents for services. Uh, we had three recommendations come out of that report and we will be presenting our update on the recommendations to the November Policy and Services Committee. So the recommendations were uh, one that was not directed at our department actually, but uh, the Office of Management and Budget in the Administrative Services Department and the City Manager's Office, uh, directing them to update the city's policy on cost recovery to allow for cost recovery over 100% of cost. Um, parks and rec programs are some of the only uh, fee um, services where you can charge a fee that exceeds the cost of providing the service uh, as state law dictates. Um, and so this is, I believe, a relatively new interpretation of the state law, which is why our city's policy limited it to 100% in the past. Um, but most of the fees that we charge in the department can exceed the cost of service. And, and what limits that? What, how does the law read? Why are we I couldn't tell you it? the exact words, but I can tell you the justification. Okay. So the idea is that if you have, um, if you are the only game in town, if you need to get your water heater reviewed by the fire department to make sure it's you know not going to tip over in an earthquake you have no choice but to pay the fire department for that uh, review and so it's not fair for them to charge you whatever they want they can only charge you up to the cost to do that service whereas if you um, have a golf course that you want to charge people to use they have lots of other options for golf courses so you're not you're not limiting them their ability to play golf uh, so you can charge market rates. Um, and so also in that was a request to the Office of Management and Budget to adjust their Questica budgeting system to allow to go over 100% of uh, the cost of something in, the fee, in their feed module. And on that recommendation, um, it hasn't begun yet, <laughs> but it's on the radar of OMB, and they're expecting to have that recommendation implemented at some point during this fiscal year. The second recommendation was directed at our department, and it was asking us to update our procedure that kind of expands on the city's policy for cost recovery. Um, they had a whole host of recommendations for that procedure, as well as the um, how we review costs and um, how we, we have a fee setting form that people can enter in costs, uh, our programmers can enter costs in to this, and it essentially is a calculator that will tell them, you know, how much they could charge in order to recover a certain amount of the cost. Um, so we have just received approval from the 
city um, city auditor's office today that they do accept the proposed changes that we had. Sorry, I'm gonna try to. Oops, I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so we will be presenting that audit recommendation as completed when we go to the Policy and Services commi uh, Committee next month. Um, so we have made all of these changes in the policy, in our procedure, and updated the calculator and updated our overhead rate uh, to make sure that we're tracking costs as we should. And the third recommendation was directed at our department as well as uh, ASD and the IT to make sure that the costs of programs are in the right spots, essentially. And we've done quite a bit of cleanup um, in my role as a budget manager. We've moved a lot of things around behind the scenes so that we can get, for example, all the children's theater summer camps are in one cost center where they had previously been sort of spread out over a variety of different um, cost centers in SAP and made it really difficult to see what the true cost of children's theater summer camps was and likewise the true revenue as well. So we've done a lot of cleanup um, in the you know, in preparation for this fiscal year, but there's more cleanup to do of several other programs before we feel like that recommendation will be fully completed. And let's see. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, actually, that's the end of the presentation, so I can take questions. Yeah, with respect to recommendation number one that seems to be lagging in implementation a little bit, is there any effect to the community services department while that is lagging? Um, no, there is not actually because the Questica fee module is very valuable for departments like Public Works and Fire Department where a huge driver of their cost is staff time and it'll calculate precisely um, the cost of 15 minutes of a management analyst time in their department. But our, um, our fees are, are set much more around market rates, so it's important to understand the total cost, but in general, when we're looking at total costs, we're looking at hourly employees or contractors providing a lot of the services who don't have high overhead rates. It's a lot easier to get a sense of the cost of a particular program and then use our calculator that gives ranges um, for cost recovery where a, a programmer can then say we're in this range of 60 to 80 dollars for you know a session of art programming is is the market what can I actually set what's reasonable compared to other programs okay so um, these automated recommendations are not actually impacting the setting of current fees no. Okay, perfect. A uh, couple of random random questions. I wasn't gonna say anything about it uh, until you mentioned the idea of true cost and therefore true, uh, you know, true charges. Um, within the SAP system, or at least within SAP software, there's the concept of activity-based costing, not just, rant, not just sort of specific direct costing. And I don't know if they if they're paying attention to that or not paying attention to that, but it's a big deal in in the SAP software, and and it would probably tell you true costs. Um, my other observation is um, two two observations. One is um, I really I really appreciate the report. I think this report is just great. Um, the problem with putting the the all of the data in the in the years as opposed to taking uh, aquatics and putting the and putting all the years together on, under aquatics is you can't really tell the direction, and, and and to me it's more the direction that some of these costs are going rather than the absolute number and you know another look at it that way. Uh, my my last observation has to do with the with the groups on the uh, at, you know I don't I don't know what page it is here, but in Exhibit One where you've got 
um, all of the CSD programs listed and then the expenses and the revenue and then the uh, recovery percentage. Um, one of the recommendations, of course, that isn't specifically listed here is that we should make the CSD grouping match the, the, the city's groupings. And one has three, one has four, or whatever. I'm not sure I care which one works. But I do think that on this cost recovery thing, it should tell me what group you think they're in. Um, so if recreation is a community benefit, is that group one? And therefore, the 50% uh, uh, the, uh, recovery is, is too high or too low or whatever. Same with uh, uh, aquatics. Is that a, a public benefit or is that more in the group three category and, and, and so on? And the reason I think that's really important, um, I appreciate that the transcript from the council uh, committee was included. And, and uh, Chair Walbach um, said that, uh, I guess in talking to Rob, gee, you know, what we want to do is make sure we have more visibility so we can participate in setting the prices. I really think that having council setting the prices is wrong. Uh, I do think you could give them the option of participating in what class things are in. And if we were more deliberately upfront about, uh, about what class and what expectations are in that class, then, then that would make, make more sense and it could save you an awful lot of uh, pain in the, in the long run. Um, yeah, I, I think those are really interesting comments. Um, this particular exhibit was, was done by the auditor and these are groupings that, that they thought were the most um, reasonable to present to the public and to the city council. They're, um, for me as the budget manager, they're at too high of a level for me to really get down into to it. I wanna look at the, like I said, the cost centers in SAP so right. I can see really specifics um, because for example, with the art center, uh, I'm going to want to see a much higher cost recovery rate for the art centers, children's fine art programs than I am for their special events and outreach. Um, because they do have in children's fine arts, that's going to be more towards the personal benefits side of the spectrum outreach and um, uh, is, is more like special events. We don't have a lot of cost recovery expectations on those. We see those as more of a public benefit. And so when you look at this on a whole, it gives you a sense altogether, it's about 43% of the cost recovered, but um, you don't know how we're doing in those specific areas where we do have uh, recovery expectations. So my first thought was to say, well, I'm really happy to have you investigate that, leave us at the higher level, but if it makes a difference in terms of what category the things are, yeah. I, I think that becomes the, 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 the important thing because then you can say, like you said, special events, and I would say, hmm, that's, is that public benefit and the cost recovery should be low, or is that something, quote, special, and therefore we should find sponsors and the cost recovery should, recovery should be really high. Or, but yeah. overall, I think this is spectacular, and thank you. I did toy with the idea of um, including the actual procedure in here for you to see, and it, it had a table of the general breakdowns for cost recovery, and, and special events was in the low cost recovery um, based on our kind of interpretation of, of the benefits. Um, but I, I think it really does depend on who's looking at it. I think special events can be decided on one by one almost. <laughs> or that, yeah. Thank, thank you. I yeah, uh, appreciate this report. Uh, quick, uh, three quick questions. Um, there's a statement that says, talks about the parks and open space and most of the costs are for maintenance. When, so there's $9.2 million spent. When it says maintenance, does that, that's including the salaries of rangers and people like that or is it, the, is it separate maintenance costs and separate salary costs? Um, that's the sum of our in-house salaries, personal, um, and as well as actual maintenance and contracts for maintenance. Okay. And um, has there been any study or what's, how do we determine what a non-resident pays? So what's the delta between what a resident pays, what a non-resident pays, and what's, what's the threshold 
for what we can charge a non-resident who's going to be taking up a spot, potentially taking up a spot of a resident. And, and so is there a formula for that or is it kind of a, a guess? No, so for most of our classes and camps, it's historically been 15%. Um, I don't have a good explanation for why it's been 15%, and I did a little bit of, of research in updating our procedure and found that a lot of other jurisdictions are charging between 25 and 40% more for non-residents. Um, and so we thought it would make sense as we move forward to start moving towards a 30% uh, increase for costs for non-residents for most of our programming. Um, facility rentals have been uh, historically higher, more like 25% over, um, over residents for those. Okay, and uh, we use active for our camp registration, that's correct. And have we, does that go out to bid periodically or uh, at least in my experience, I've, I've dealt with them and, and found them it's possible to, to uh, negotiate with them, but certainly you need to have another vendor or have used another vendor. But uh, was wondering when the contract for that is up. So the contract for that is, I believe there's about eight, I wanna say it ends late in, in uh, 2019. And I have it on my um, calendar that we'll be starting the RFP process this spring. Um, and I, I wanna get started on it early because we'll need a lot of time if we're going to switch software vendors. Yes, there's there's definitely some pain in migration of all of your programs and all of the literature that you have from one to another. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, th thank you for the report and, and for the explanations. The, uh, some information bet between the lines is, is helpful. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you have a example or two of of programs or activities where fees would increase uh, to market rates and you know, what that what the, that increase would be um we when we did our initial breakdown trying to make sure we could implement this uh, procedure i actually didn't see any programs that had a fee that was out of line with the percentile that we would have we have applied. Um, so I think that our programmers have a really good sense of where their kind of money is coming in and, and, and it's generally classes, camps, and facility rentals. Those are money generators, whereas like I said, um, special events and uh, park maintenance are, are not. So when we've been asked to make budget cuts for example, in the past, we've been given the opportunity to either cut or increase revenues with, you know, expenses might go up, but not as much as the revenue. So we've been doing, I would say, a pretty good job of making sure that we are sticking in these um, cost recovery ranges, if not exceeding them. Thank you, that's all. Um, I have a couple items. So. Uh, this is really fantastic. I never had any idea how we set prices, and, and I'm particularly um, uh, happy about those four categories. Uh, and so the idea that you can subsidize more those things that have the best benefit for the community and for health of the community and things like that versus... Um, um, versus wood shop classes for adults, um, which are more personal. So I think that that's fantastic. And the fact, I, I suspect there isn't very much low hanging fruit that you've been managing this for years. And this is, um, I, I was really surprised at how much we, we um, how little we recover costs. I expected that we would, be recovering 100% of our costs for almost everything that's personal or even partially personal. And the fact that only the golf comes even close is uh, surprising to me. And that I would, I would have thought that all of these would be higher. But it's obvious from this conversation that you're, you're, you have market forces that 
some of these classes, people can go other places like the YMCA. And then you're also, the demand, I noticed that you have uh, a number of classes where there, you didn't even meet the minimum. And instead of cutting the class or canceling the class, you went ahead and did it anyway. And so, um, but the demand is really important. And, and also, this thing about cost recovery uh, percentages, um, you could give a lot more scholarships and come out way ahead by charging closer to the market rate for some of these things uh, that have benefits, uh, but give, um, be more generous with your scholarships. So I hope that that, uh, that will come out as well. So, um, so that, and then the other thing I, I saw that um, if you don't do your cost recovery, uh, you'll end up subsidizing programs, uh, more programs than you needed to, and that there will be, some residents will pay more or less than appropriate and that the city will not achieve its social goals and objectives, uh, such as subsidizing low-income individuals and seniors. So it is really important to try to boost that up, and this is, this is a, a really an amazing uh, effort that you're doing, and uh, I hope, hope you can uh, keep, keep moving it up. Thanks. So just um, a couple of questions, um, particularly about Coverly. Um, the cost recovery at Coverly, does it come mostly from the rentals or from the program? Where does, where, does, where does the revenue come from at Coverly? So the revenue that you're looking at here is for our hourly rentals. Okay. Um, I, I'm not quite sure why, but they didn't include the lease rentals mm. in the revenue. Okay. Um, yeah, but, but that's what it is. And then the aquatic program um, has gone down in cost recovery, if I'm reading this right, from 2015 to 2016. So. Yes. Uh, so that was, you know, something that we're hoping is going to turn around. And it's going to go up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with Palo Alto Swim and Sport. And so um, for a program, for instance, so there's the direct cost of what it costs to put on the program, and then the city costs would be indirect costs that are added on top of that program? Yes, so um, our overhead rate is approximately 35%, and that includes uh, our own department's admins, such as Kristen and my mm -hmm. time, as well as the city attorney's office, budget, you know, the printing, every, all of the city costs. And so those are things that you don't really have much control over. It's just a number that you get. That's right. And right. so we, we check that periodically and apply that when we're doing okay. the analysis. And so you don't expect to be um, big increases in fees that we're charging residents coming down the pike? No, I don't think so. That's what I heard that people said, so I just want to check. Oh, that. yeah. yeah. Um, market rate has a huge impact, mm -hmm. so we really can't charge a huge increase over what you could do if you go to Menlo Park or YMCA or whatever it is. Um, so our programmers have been very uh, aware of market rates. They could tell you right now if you went and quizzed somebody how much it costs to go to Gymboree or you know mm -hmm. come to our program. Um, and, and we try to stay in line. We don't wanna go significantly above or also significantly under undercut our you know, local competitors. Right. So. Thank you very much. So uh, following up on that then, so trying to uh, beat the market price is very difficult to do. So that means you have to reduce costs. And do you think that Palo Alto costs are much more, much higher than other cities around where those market forces uh, have made the price lower? Um, no, I, I did some research while this audit was occurring, and we actually are right in line with the other areas that I saw, Mountain View, San Jose, Menlo Park, 
Walnut Creek, um, we're recovering costs at roughly the same amount. And when you're looking at a table like, like this that shows you know, a, a range um, for as low as roughly 30% re cost recovery in theater, music, and dance, or as high as 85% for golf, um, that's including all of those programs that we provide that have no cost recovery expectations. So with, chil with theater, music, and dance, for example, that includes um, the summer concert series, where we don't expect anyone to pay for that. And we probably should investigate getting sponsorships more, <laughs> but historically that hasn't been a big uh, driver. And that, that whole cost is, is in this number. Um, we also have, not in, what you're not seeing here are um, programs that we don't charge a fee for, such as participating in the children's theater, uh, presentations, being one of the actors, you don't pay for that, but in exchange for not having a fee, the children's theater, the Friends of the Children's Theater has sort of um, made a deal that they will cover the cost of that through donations. So the donations are not included here. Um, so you're not getting a um, complete picture if you just look at what comes through city revenues in our department. Okay, and then the, the last thing is that when you look at the market rate, uh, say it's $25 for a class for an hour, are you, uh, you could, could you raise it to match the non-resident price that a, a Palo Alto would have to pay to go to Me Menlo Park to take that same class? So they, you would both be $25 an hour, but, but if, if the Palo Alto went over there, they'd pay 35, so could you pay, charge 35? I think that's definitely something we could consider. Um, we've historically, we've had these really wide ranges, right? So recreation classes, for example, can be between 30 and 70% cost recovery. And we've left the actual pricing to the division, you know, divisions managers to really see how they want to set that. And it's something we could consider, especially if we get into another budget crunch. Are there ways that we could um, increase fees without losing a lot of customers on some of those programs? But um, it isn't something that we've scrubbed, so to speak, in that manner. Okay, good stuff. I really enjoyed this. Uh, a couple questions. What are human services? Um, those are mostly the HISRAP programs. What? Uh, the human, it's the, the HISRAP, I can't think of what that acronym stands. Resource allocation, Resource allocation program. So if, if Minka has come to you guys um, with her list of nonprofit service providers, uh, Oh, this is coordination the city so does? So Human Services provides um, a, a few different things. Their main um, program that they have are the what's called the HISREP grants, which is Human Services Resource Allocation Program, and they're grants that different organizations can apply for to um, help fund their organization's mission to help with um, more social services within Palo Alto. So um, one that's been funded in the past is like adolescent counseling services within the school district. Um, I'm trying to think of some others, but um, it, the, we, the human services works with downtown streets team. So it's okay. those um, programs. The CARA grief counseling. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. And, and as well as um, Avenidas and the Palo Alto Children's Community Center, PACCC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Also, I was looking at the 2013 table there. Uh, public art had a negative revenue. I'm not sure how you get negative revenue. Uh, I found that curious, but we don't expect much revenue out of that anyway. But I would think that'd be a zero as opposed to negative. Hmm. Um, Oh, so you mentioned about the friends fees do not show up here. So if we included the friends fees as additional, um, well, when CSD is looking at its goals, does it consider the friends fees? 
Yes. And are they revenue or are they decreased expenses? It's generally, it depends. So that would change yeah. your number, right? If you're, it doesn't change the delta, but it, the percentage depends. You take it off the numerator or the denominator. Right. Right. Um, and uh, David mentioned scholarships. Do we see a lot of scholarships for the programs? Do people apply to get reduced fees? Um, it's not as not as many as I would have guessed, uh, given who I think would qualify in the community. It's. Um, what do you need? You need income? Is that yeah, it's, a, it's income? based on income. You need to be a resident or within the school district. It's only available to children and seniors and uh, adults with disabilities. It's limited to $300 of subsidy per calendar, uh, no, per 12 month rolling period. So whenever you apply, you have 12 months. Um, we actually had our summer intern look at this and I can't remember a lot of the details in terms of how, I wanna say that the seniors were, who do use the program use about $75 uh, on average and the, the youth who use the program use 150 on average so they're not actually using up all of the um, allotment that they could use you can get either a 25% or 50% discount on the classes and camps. Um, and it also includes community garden fees. Uh, it's something that we could, and we've been asked in the past to investigate expanding it. Um, and it's certainly something that we could expand. It ends up costing about $35,000 in total uh, to provide all of these uh, fee reduction subsidies each year. How do, how do we publicize that? How do people know about it? It's on the city's website and it's also in the enjoy catalog, um, right a, in the sort of information on how to register for things. It's on a regular basis? It's in every enjoy catalog, yeah. So do we think that people aren't signing up because they don't know about it or that they don't need it or? I think there's several possibilities. Um, one, they don't know about it. Another is that our our reduction is not deep enough actually. So 25% discount off of a $300 camp is still a lot of money for someone, you know, who is struggling. Um, so we could try, I mean, we've thought if we wanna make changes, we could try something sort of in beta test form to figure out what interest there is and, and how. What is the income limit to qualify? You know? I believe it's 80% of the Santa Clara County, um, what's considered kind of the, the 100, it's, um, oh, I can't think of the term, but essentially it's based on your family size as well as your income. And it's the same um, numbers that Santa Clara County publishes for affordable housing units. So the, it's kind of the same cutoffs that you would get if you want to get into a low income housing unit. And I would think that if we should make it that if your income is low enough that you have a much deeper discount than 25%. So we do have a 50%. Um, yeah, so, so you can get either 25 or 50%. Okay. The 50% discount is I want to say it's sixty percent of the very of the um, what's considered the county median income, and I think if you're up to eighty percent of that income median income, you can get twenty five percent off. So more people take advantage of the fifty percent discount. Who doesn't take advantage are those people who don't qualify for the fifty. A lot there's not a lot of people taking advantage of a twenty five percent discount. I, I think we should try to really increase the scholarships. Yeah. Because there are poor people in Palo Alto. There, there are local uh, nonprofits that basically waive, for, a scholarship is to waive the fees. And I would suggest we might even want to consider that. I mean, you're, you're spending, of this total budget, you said 75000 Maybe we, Maybe we could be a little more aggressive. Yeah, 35000 actually, so even below that. Um, then let's go to seventy-five thousand. Well, yeah, we it, the the idea is, the ideal would be to figure out what is the seventy-five thousand dollar 
um, program because the reason that we sort of cut it down to what it is now is that roughly 10 years ago, we had almost no limit on um, this program. I think it was a 75% discount. There was no annual limit to how much you could take for it. Um, and it, it was several hundred thousand dollars. I think it was close to $400,000. Um, and, and so we had to kind of, but we might have swung it a little too far. Right, so more generous, uh, um, a, a more generous program with better control. I would like to see 5% increase across the board and then really concentrate on scholarships. Yeah, it's something that we've talked about, uh, Kristen and I, um, as presenting or presenting that as part of our budget proposal package in the spring to really get a good sense of what we might want to try changing and how it would fit into our you know, overall budget. My last question is about flow of fees. Uh, so when we collect money, does that go to CSD or does it go straight back to the city? In most cases, it goes to CSD. Um, in the case of Coverly leaseholders, those go straight into the city. I can't think of any other program where it goes straight into the city. Okay, so if there was some class that was very popular and we had more room and more teachers, we have enough funding to say we're going to offer a new class and collect the fees and pay for that directly. Um, if if we've already used up all of our say temporary salary or part-time salary dollars for that particular program area, we would have to go to the budget office to request that they add money and we normally can't, we can't just collect the fees and then pay our people or it has to go oh it yeah. is more complicated than that yeah <laughs> it's always more complicated is the answer okay so the, we would have to go then say we want to offer another course and we think we're going to fill it up can we have the money and then we collect it and yes and pass the passer all around <laughs> yeah okay. and generally there's a timing issue but they have you know generally say yes to things like that okay does anyone else have any go backs? Okay, very good. We really appreciate this. It was very Thank you. well done. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Rinconada Park Long Range Plan. Peter Jensen is here. Good to see you, Peter. Good to see you as well. Yeah, this is meat and potatoes for us. This is what. <clears throat> Park design. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, Commissioners. Peter Jensen, Landscape Architect for the City of Palo Alto. Um, very excited to be here tonight um, uh, to um, hopefully get your recommendation for the adoption of the uh, Rincon Island Long Range Plan as well as the environmental work that uh, coincided with it. Uh, the uh, project itself has a, uh, been going on for several years, um, especially the last few years as it's been coupled with the JMZ and the design of that and a, uh, refining that design down to the point where we could a, uh, uh, do the basically the environmental work. Now that that work has been a, a completed and we're through the uh, 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 public process uh, of review of that document. Uh, we're back tonight to a, uh, uh, request this recommendation. Uh, I'm going to do a little uh, presentation here, and then we can uh, uh, move into uh, discuss uh, discussion. Uh, at some point, I uh, hope that we can get to a vote where we can adopt as well. Um, I think we went in pretty good detail last time of uh, what was in the long range plan itself. Uh, I will uh, give a little synopsis of those things and um, um, kind of group those things uh, into the elements in the park that we would like to uh, add or renovate or maintain there. Um, of course, the image up on the screen currently is what we have in Rinconada Park. Uh, I think it is very important to, uh, to talk about the long-range plan in a similar sense as the master plan itself, uh, where the uh, recommendations made uh, in the plan, um, uh, especially on the, if we can move down here to the, the plan itself, um, are uh, um, 
recommendations for general uh, uh, items that we want to, like I said, either add, renovate, uh, or maintain in the park. Um, as you'll see in the process, and of course, along just with the master plan process as well, as when specific uh, projects come back uh, to the commission um, for redevelopment or adding new features that we will have the uh, opportunity uh, to uh, really uh, vet those uh, ideas out and to expand on those. I do have a couple of those uh, uh, that we are actually working on now with the west end of the park, just to kind of give you a general idea of of what I'm talking about there. I can move through some of these, I think. The image showing up on the screen now is the, uh, uh, the current design of the parking lot for Rinconada Park. So uh, if you compare that design to the design that's shown uh, in the schematic plan for the long range plan, there are definitely differences. And those differences uh, derive out of a more complex design process, basically, that uh, has more community input, uh, more input from the commission, uh, as well as more input just from staff on the, on the design. So for the parking lot itself of Rinconada Park, uh, the development of the uh, access uh, pedestrian uh, bicycle link that links out to uh, Embarcadero there uh, is a new feature that is not currently shown in the graphic for the long range plan. Um, and again, that derived out of the kind of development of the project itself. Uh, the gen uh, Junior Museum and Zoo, uh, its footprint is smaller than what is shown in the long range plan. And again, that comes from direct feedback from the commission as well as the uh, community. So there's a lot of flexibility, I think, within the plan that uh, I just want to kind of bring up as we go along. The next one is uh, our early development of the west end of the park itself and the redesign of the playground. Um, so um, I don't think we've talked about this recently, but we did uh, apply for an inclusive playground grant from the city or the county of Santa Clara. Uh, and we've developed this plan as that process to go out and get the grant and provide the pricing for such a thing. So if you start to compare, again, this design to what is shown in the long range plan, there are definitely going to be differences to them. Um, as far as the, I guess, the major elements that we want to see uh, within the plan that the plan addresses uh, are the connection aspects to uh, Rinconada Park and linking the elements all around the park. Uh, creating that central walkway uh, that gets you from the art center over to Lucy Stern, uh, combining the playgrounds together, adding more group picnic areas, uh, developing again that link, um, which is then to move the, the central restroom off kind of the focal, uh, the visual, I guess, corridor in the park uh, next to the, the pool facility, so that is uh, more open. Um, and then, like I said, a, a lot of connections around the park and pathway work and um, those types of things that uh, uh, the park really needs. So, um, you know, I, as I said, we've been in the process of developing the plan and really the plan's kind of been developed a few years ago. Uh, and now we're at a point, uh, I think that we're ready to move forward and I know the park is ready to move forward with some renovations out there. So it uh, uh, would be nice to kind of uh, get to that aspect where we can actually do some things in the park by uh, recommending adoption of the plan. Um, the adoption itself is actually uh, on a timeline linked with the uh, Junior Museum and Zoo uh, project since they uh, are linked together in the development of the park and the parking lot and the Junior Museum and Zoo space. Uh, the plan currently now is to take the uh, long range plan to council on November 27th along with a whole bunch of other things, agreements between the friends of the Junior Museum and the city uh, and the CEQA document uh, and have that adopted. So basically the Junior Museum and Zoo project and the Rinconada Long Range Plan project can proceed forward. Um, there were questions last time from the uh, presentation before that are addressed in the staff report. Uh, we can discuss those items. Um, and any other questions that you may have. So I don't, if you would like me, I can go into more specific detail about things at the park, but that's up to you. I wanna say one thing, I really like this table with all the comments and the responses. Quite often when we do follow-ups, we don't know 
if our comment was ignored, why it was ignored. So this is very good. I, I like that a lot. I'm going to give uh, credit to Kristen on that for making that up for the in the master plan process as we uh, went through that. I think it is a uh, it makes it a lot clearer um, and specifically addresses I think the comments from the previous meeting, which is a, a I think a lot more transparent in how they are addressed in the in the plan itself. So I, I felt like you were spoon feeding the commissioners on that one, and it's, it's appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> And do you want to start? Do you have any questions? Or are you? <laughs> well, this a uh, uh, the question was: uh, Do we have money for the uh, the prod the long range plan itself, which is based over a 25 year uh, period? So currently, we have uh, funding for uh, a portion of Phase One. Uh, that portion around the Junior Museum and Zoo. Uh, majority of that money is going to go to the reconfiguration of the parking lot, uh, and then we're going to try to stretch as much as possible to also include this uh, West End work uh, in that process as well. Uh, the Junior Museum and Zoo is looking at constructing next summer, uh, so sometime after that we would also be then embarking on kind of this phase one. Um, I think the further funding of the plan goes along with the rest of our funding conversations about a, uh, renovations to the park. Uh, in our study of the uh, renovation process, uh, it, we're looking between one and two million dollars every basically four years to the park to achieve what is in the plan. Uh, that does not include big ticket items like the pool though, um, which are kind of bigger standalone capital projects uh, to do that. So um, do we have the money to do it all right now? No, we do not. Uh, but it, uh, most of the things in the plan are definitely items that we really want to do, um, especially the connection aspects and uh, just the upkeep and maintenance of the park to maintain the, the uh, way that it is now. So. Um, we will definitely be putting in the future, of course, together more capital improvement requests to a, uh, keep moving forward with the renovations of the park itself. Um, will the first phase one that goes with the Junior Museum include that park restroom at that west end? Uh, that is the, uh, the plan. If we can get it in there, we've talked about, um, which again kind of goes back to some of the conversations before, uh, maybe using some park impact funds for that. Since there's not a restroom down there, park impact f uh, funds can be used for uh, new amenities. So they couldn't be applied towards the playground because the playground already is in that location, but it could be applied towards a restroom. And that would be one of the revenue streams that we'd be drawing from to build that. Of course, we also have a, a CIP for new restrooms, so we could use our upcoming CIP to fund that as well. I think there's some options in doing that, but the plan would be to get the restroom in there, yes. Okay. The only other thing um, um, is parking. Um, have I know that uh, the city council is, is uh, concerned about um, not too much parking and a, a lot of other alternatives. So you have the shuttle uh, stop and you have the bike paths. And uh, do you think that you'll get any pushback on the number of parking spaces? The number of parking spaces in the uh, new design of the parking lot is very similar to the what's out there now. I think it's actually a, a few less than what is there now. Um, the environmental review studied parking there. Uh, during the weekdays, the parking was sufficient for the facility itself. Uh, of course, in peak hours and on the weekend, the parking lot itself is impacted. Um, instead of, uh, I think, expanding into some of the uh, oak tree stands there to make the parking lot bigger, to grasp 10 more spaces that it was felt by Public Work and Transportation Department that um, it wasn't worth that impact to supply that few of parking stalls. Um, I think it's always going to be an impact to the park itself. It just does not have a lot of parking around there. The, definitely the overflow parking usually happens to the neighborhood to the north along Hopkins and, and in that direction. And I think during big scale events that that is going to continue to happen. 
Yeah, and I, th I think the Junior Museum is going to be quite um, a draw. And, uh, and with, with the uh, theater works uh, or the Palo Alto Players and uh, other events at Lucy Stern, it, it could get uh, quite hairy. But um, I think this is the best we can do. Yeah, I think that a, uh, uh, one thing that uh, we talked about previously with staff working on is just a, uh, making sure that the calendars of those uh, facilities around uh, that parking lot that basically use that parking lot a, uh, uh, are taking into account each other and, and what they're doing there. So hopefully that the, the Lucy Stern doesn't rent itself out for a wedding while the Junior Museum has a large event out there itself. Uh, those types of things I think can help really uh, you know, lessen the impact of that limited parking out there. Um, I think the other thing that's that also is uh, helping uh, with parking as well is the uh, the expansion of the parking lot and allowing uh, more school bus um, to come to Junior Museum and Zoo that uh, will alleviate some of just the the single cars that are coming there. So uh, that's also another uh, uh, option of, of reducing that. Uh, this, is this is an amazing plan, uh, offering uh, lots of resources to the community on many different levels and, and lots of details, so great job with that, thank you. I appreciate seeing uh, the additional circulation diagrams, and I, I have some questions, just not quite sure what, what you're trying to convey in, 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 in some, of the, some of the choices of them. So there's the circulation diagram, circulation and connections, and you have three three different levels of, of paths, uh, the type A main pathway, type B secondary pathway, and type C support pathway, and, and that, which, is, which is clear, that, that, that's great. Then on the next diagram, you're showing the circulation diagram of major connections, and you're, uh, rather than just showing the, the type A, you're, 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 by, you're not showing the type A uh, path through the center of the park. I'm just wondering what, what that decision was based on. Are we talking about the graphic that's up on the screen? Yes. Currently? So, so the the main path, the, the more direct path between the pink dot and the zoo, it isn't highlighted there. So. Right. A um, and this was uh, the the graphics that you're seeing there that are in the appendix are from the initial study from a uh, the site analysis that was done uh, of pathways through the park. Uh, mostly the graphic is there to show that the, this path of travel from one end to the other is taken. I do agree that it starts to get up onto the other pathway. At the time that the consultant was a, a doing a, a field operation or observations, the, uh, this particular path and actually in the process of the master or the long range plan itself, um, uh, there were three options of pathways through the park. Um, of where the primary path could go. Uh, this was one of them that was shown at the beginning. Uh, it did receive a lot of community pushback that the actual lower path along the school was the main path that should be linking there. Uh, and that's the path that then that is now associated with the, the development of the plan. So, uh, so, so the, these some of these drawings are a little bit uh, out of date then? Yeah, and they were just involved from the, the first site analysis basically work that started to study where people kind of moved and entered through the park and how they, they got from one end to the other or they accessed it from the surrounding neighborhoods. Okay, and then, that, then I had kind of similar questions on the, the pedestrian path and the, uh, the bike path, uh, of, of tra the bike paths of travel. For example, on the, on the bike paths, there's kind of a a dead end at the, at, the, at the school, there's no direct path from, from the parking lot middle field area uh, to the center of the park. And uh, similarly in the, on the pedestrian uh, paths, there's nothing on Middlefield Road. There's obviously lots of people walking from their homes in the community it, in, into, the, into the park. So it would seem, I'm just wondering why there weren't circulation paths sh shown for uh, I think that use the, cases like that. Right. The absence of actually those, I think, were kind of some of the main aspects of the analysis itself where uh, for the pedestrian pathway that really there um, is no, along Middlefield, a, a clear connection into the actual park itself because of the boundary of the school that's there and then the parking lot, the junior museum and zoo, 
that there was no clear access into the park to uh, uh, show that in an analysis diagram. That's something that we wanted to make and that came clear from basically doing these things, uh, doing the analysis. The other one, uh, especially with the, the bike path at the end of the school, uh, that access point, um, which is right here, right. Uh, currently doesn't really have a great access point to it, but a lot of uh, kids from the surrounding neighborhoods use that as their main access point into the, uh, the school grounds itself. Um, there was no way, uh, identified actually bike path of travel there. Um, uh, but as we develop the plan, the plan is to add basically, you know, a, that link from Middlefield as well as a direct link from Hopkins to the back of the school there that helped develop kind of the connection point. So are these diagrams, for the purposes of analysis, to determine what, what uh, paths you need to end up with? or? Is, is this part of the plan? The way, the way it's labeled, it looks like this is this is your plan. Right. No, these are the word used to analyze a uh, where paths were uh, uh, being used and where uh, links or connections were missing in that plan to develop the plan overall. Okay. And we can make I think that a uh, um, in the appendix I think we can clean that up a little by titling them a, a little bit differently so it's clear that they're used more for analysis aspects than actual the plan itself. It's more, more historical. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Um, before you leave this picture, yep. um, that the, the neighborhood down in the lower left, there is really no clear bike path except on Embarcadero. And so uh, you, you see the, uh, the arrow coming down. Yes, right there, right there. Right. There should be at least a, uh, a crosswalk or something to get down into that area and all all the way into Stanford, right. uh, is there any plan for that? No, actually, and a, uh, um, the plan discusses that, and 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 you know, I say that there's a first phase, but actually, there's been phases that have taken from this plan already that are going on. So currently, right now, uh, transportation is working on that's the Kellogg basically intersection in Barcadero. They're adding a uh, an enhanced crosswalk there, basically across the street, which does not exist now. They've actually also uh, designated Kellogg a bike route, designated bike route. That's where then the development of then that, the eliminating that driveway and actually just making it a pedestrian bike access path straight across Kellogg into the park uh, came to be through that development of that process. So uh, that was definitely uh, something that we uh, recognized that was recognized early in the development of the plan and uh, is always starting to be addressed in the plan, so. A uh, great plan, excited to see it come to fruition and, and get going. Uh, one quick question, and I don't know if it's out of the, the scope of, of things, but the path from the children's library into the park, and right now it's, it's, it's kind of a strange path right now for a kid because it goes by two driveways. I think one of them's for maybe the refuse or I don't know if it's a service lane, and then it, it crosses a parking lot. So if you were a kid, it's, it's kind of a tough walk. What uh, changes with the new parking lot or from, if you were coming from the children's library and you were a younger kid with or without a parent, what's any changes yes. to that path? So we are definitely going to address that because yes, right now it's kind of a, you know, an ambivalent zone of your, where you're supposed to walk and it does cross a few driveways there. Um, and in fact, a, a, some of the walkways are the ramps of the driveways coming in. There's really not a specific sidewalk there. From the actual, uh, I guess, the, the edge of the children's library that makes kind of the curve there at Hopkins and uh, yeah, um, we are going to rebuild that whole thing and put a, a sidewalk there, uh, actually extend the ramps out a little bit uh, and make that whole connection there a lot better than what it is because uh, right now, yes, it's a uh, uh, there's no clear kind of direction there. Also going to uh, shift the driveway there that's down a little bit and line up more with Harriet there to uh, uh, make that a clear entry. Right now it's kind of pushed off to the side, so uh, we're definitely going to address that area. Great, thank you. Cause, uh, and I also appreciated the addition of the sidewalk all along Hopkins. 
which right now doesn't exist. And I think that's a, right. a great addition. Thank you. Now that is, you know, besides the main path in the center of the parkway, which is kind of the featured pathway just because it gets you an interior uh, of the space, the direct link along Hopkins is very important. And currently right now along the tennis courts, there is no sidewalk at all. You have to walk behind the cars, which isn't the greatest situation. And then uh, actually along the magical bridge edge, there's a sort of decomposed granite path there that uh, uh, um, is no longer considered really accessible. So uh, to continue the path from one end of the park to the other is, is a key feature. So Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, re the comments relative to the table, uh, everybody was saying thank you very much. I was, I'd like to double that or triple that because I think half the questions and half the half the table were my questions. <laughs> and thank you, <laughs> thank you very much for the detail on that. It was probably done so you could point out I asked too many questions. Um, the, I did not uh, say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in terms of the presentation, uh, I do want to comment on the timeline slide. Um, I think congratulations or thank you to you and all, everybody else involved for the perseverance uh, that has, uh, has gone on. Um, I don't happen to have, and I, I should have my copy of the plan that, that we had from before with us. Um, but one, one comment would be in, in this presentation, it says long range plan, why? And then it says project goals. Um, I, I think what's missing from there, and I don't know if it's actually in the plan, but just and missing from the presentation, or if it, if it was missing in the first place, is something about access to nature. Um, this basically just uh, uh, describes everything else you're, you're trying to do, but the park is big enough, and particularly at the one end, it's got lots of opportunity for access to nature, and I think you are doing things there. I think that should be, if it's not in the plan itself, it should be. If it's just missing from the presentation, I'm sure you're gonna be making this presentation again, and particularly to council. I think it, I think it needs to be called out. Okay. Um, in that, if it was called out and we thought about it more, um, <clears throat> I'm still bothered, and I know I asked this question before, by the fact that this is sort of described as a nature area, and then you've got the magical forest over here, and you've got this corridor in between, and then across the street, you've got all of that park area that's part of the library. And it would seem to me that if that was looked at as all one piece instead of three separate pieces, that's a non-trivial amount of nature access, including, and not, you know, people access to nature, but also nature access to habitat. Right. Um, and, and so I'd like, to, I'd like to see that reinforced. The other thing, I hate to go back to the table, um, but um, if you could find that slide that has the pedestrian circulation. Yeah, this one. Um, consistent with what Jeff was just talking about too. Uh, I think in fact, um, when I talked about circulation, I talked about, I thought about some of the parks where once you get to the park, then you can walk around in a circle and, and you can measure out, is that a quarter mile, a half mile, or whatever else. Everything we've done here, and I think you've done a tremendous job of it, is not so much circulation within the park as, as it is access to the park, or in fact, as you were just talking about, um, how you get from point A to point B at, at one end of the park or the other. And just like you were just talking about, if, if this diagram, included a path behind the magical forest and behind the tennis courts, I could see that you could easily create a, a very nice long walk that included watching people on the fields, uh, passing the swimming court, walking through that nature area. Sure, you had to get back out behind the tennis courts, but you could, you could create a, a really long walk. And if you went further, and, and included going around the school on the outside, uh, th th it, it would become a tremendous fitness area, uh, particularly for older people that are into walking and not running or whatever. For runners, you know, getting through the park and finding the bathroom on the way, that's great. <laughs> but for walkers, going around and around, and 
I'd like to see that added. I'm not going to stand in the way of, of a recommendation and a, and, and a movement with it tonight. But as you say, if in each of these drawings they might be considered incomplete and, a, and one more red line could be added, I would sure like to see that. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy. I like this. I don't have any comments. Um, big picture, we went, did this for Rinconada. We have two other large parks, Greer and Mitchell. Uh, do we have something similar to that coming forward for those two? Not currently, no, we don't. I mean, that's something that we can definitely talk about. Um, the initial CIP for Rinconada Park was to renovate the pathways and drainage and irrigation in 2008. So here we are now at 2017. A, uh, uh, it was thought though at the time that there was money allotted. Uh, there was not my position in the city um, and no one knew exactly what that money was supposed to be tied to and exactly what we were supposed to be fixing out there. Uh, so the idea was then to move into a long range planning process for it to figure that aspect out. Um, I think that I would probably have simplified the graphic itself to just be a little uh, 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 more bubble diagram to explain what we'd like to see out there and, and try to lessen the time. Uh, to develop the plan so we could get to the actual stage of implementation. So um, I think that well, uh, I mean, funding is a big issue. And so right. something like this is going to go a long way in getting funding because it, right. it is a nice big plan. Right. So yes. Yeah, so I mean, currently the uh, for our other regional parks, which I think it would be uh, more appropriate to do those types of things that a, uh, uh, it is something that we can consider doing. Um, you know, currently right now the capital improvement uh, uh, budget is based on maintenance of existing. Uh, now we have the parks master plan, which has a whole bunch of stuff in it that we'd like to implement. Uh, a lot of those things are implemented at our regional parks. So, um, you know, we may want to consider, um, I know that Mitchell Park, I think is coming up for a, a good size renovation in four or five years from now. So, you know, that's, I think we can have further conversations if we want to, um, uh, maybe start up the planning development a little bit sooner than that to try to identify then uh, the elements from the master plan that are recommended for the park to add new items to it and uh, how we can develop that uh, uh, further. So, um, what about Greer Park? That always Greer Park seems, as well. Always seems like it's not very polished. I mean, we had the athletic fields, which you get a lot of use, right? But the facilities in Greer don't, don't seem to be the same togetherness as Mitchell or Rinconada. Yeah, I, um, I think the development of the park itself is definitely different than Mitchell and Rinconada Park, which were designed by RHAA in the 1950s, uh, where there's a definitely uh, that that design group is very well known for the uh, detail and the thought that was put into those uh, parks. And you can see Mitchell Park uh, Rinconada Park, they have elements that have kind of stood the, you know, stand of time and, and are still very well used. Uh, I think the ideas behind the development of Greer Park was to develop a more of a sports complex field area that uh, lacks some of those details. So um, there is nothing on the books currently for any type of renovation for Greer Park in the short term, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that uh, we can't look at uh, how we can improve it or add new enhancements uh, to that park. So I really think that uh, having a thoughtful process with Greer might be useful and be able to sit, step back and say, what could we use here and where we would put it and develop a plan like this that is kind of inspirational and says uh, this is what we're, our eventual goal is. Because I don't think we have an eventual goal for Greer. It just seems to be used and kept as is. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. I have one more comment related to the circulation paths. I think it might be interesting to consider signage 
uh, somewhere within the park that would show a circular route or multiple routes and, and list or state what the distances of that. I think people would be interested in knowing this is a half mile loop, this is a, a, one, a mile loop or whatever, whatever it is. I wouldn't go overboard with it and right. probably including that in one place is sufficient, but I think that would be popular. No, I think that definitely would be a uh, definitely one of the main aspects of the park as far as uh, uh, exercise facility goes is was maintaining kind of that inner loop around the turf area. <laughs> uh, but to uh, Don's point, I think that uh, providing the opportunity uh, to have different pathways or provide the opportunity that these pathways link up into different sequences that could be more interesting to walk instead of the same loop over and over again. Uh, and identifying those in the park, I think that's a, uh, definitely a great way to uh, uh, promote that aspect of it. Um, so people just don't think about the kind of utilitarian aspect of walking through the space, but they can also gain some type, I think some physical, maybe it also will promote people to use the pathways for physical activity as well. So. Okay, so this is an action item. I need a motion for approvement of the Rinconada long-term, or probably long-range plan. Okay, do we have a second? second? We have a second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, unanimous. I think you have to make a recommendation on the environmental as well. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is the environmental, what actually are we improving? And last time I would say uh, I presented on the uh, uh, the findings for the uh, of the mitigation. Uh, oh. They were the standard findings. Gotcha. Uh, nothing has come back from the community that would require any further amendment or revision to the uh, CEQA document itself. So uh -oh. uh, pretty much is is what it is. Okay. Uh, do we have two separate motions or one? Okay, okay. That's strange. My agenda does not have that on, but Jeff's does. Do we have a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. So the environmental is also passed. Thank you very much. Ad hoc and liaison updates. Does anyone? Everything? Yeah, uh, quickly, I met with uh, Palo Alto Recreation Foundation, and they've agreed to be an organization that would accept donations toward the master plan. However, they would like to target any donations toward programs which would keep toward the mission of what they do as an organization. We had the school board and uh, city get together once a month and we had a, a, a sharing of athletic facilities overview. Uh, it actually wouldn't be bad to have Stephanie come in here and just, it, it took 10 minutes or something, but I think it would be worth listening to her. Sure, um, we can arrange for that. And what Chair Rechtal is referring to is we gave a presentation at the city school liaison committee um, which is two school district board members and two council members, um, just on the current facilities that are shared between the city and the school district and the agreements that are in place to um, make the sharing happen. So we can come back with that presentation here as well. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, it, it, she has it done and I thought it was useful. So it'd be worth our time. And I think it's probably 10 minutes or something like that. So it's not bad. Uh, and next month we meet about, um, Middle school athletics, is that, a, is that a set or is that tentative? Um, I have to, I think it's, yeah, I think it's set for November. It was originally December and I think they've moved it to November, so. Yeah. Oh, this is for the confirm. liaison committee, not here. And, uh, and that's something else that if we put together a presentation for that, we may want to bounce that to here afterwards. Definitely, and we could maybe combine that presentation. Um, since it's related to the school district. Okay. So, Keith, would that um, presentation conclude the places that um, are possibilities for use of um, school district facilities that we're not able to use right now? Mm -hmm. um, and what the barriers are to them? We talked a little bit about what 
um, other opportunities uh -huh. for sharing space are, which would be the high schools. We currently uh -huh. don't use the high school gyms or fields. Um, and then also pool access, additional swimming pools. Um, we talked about it briefly and what was decided is, you know, that, that was a forum to mention it, but not really make uh -huh. um, progress on it. So we discussed having a regular meeting where it's staff from the two um, agencies would talk about moving things forward like that. And there could be opportunities where the school district wants to use city property. So that would be the right form probably to do it. So we talked about convening a group of staff. So that's really great news because it feels like this has been a really long discussion and barriers pop up that may be solvable and may not be, but given all of the um, demand for facilities, especially for sports, it would be great to investigate every single inch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Along those lines, the Coverly, uh, separate and distinct from the long-term plan, we use Coverly gyms a whole lot and other properties, uh, pa pa school district property uh, on that site. And so can we talk about that a little bit? Um, the current use of those gyms, because I don't really know, uh, every time I walk by there, there's badminton or volleyball or whatever, but I really don't know how much we're really using um, on that site. Sure, we can include that in our presentation as well. I, I would just put out a reminder that uh, Project Safety Net is having a meeting tomorrow, um, and what they're doing is reviewing the, the results from the uh, develop, development assets survey. The development assets are something that we as a commission, I think, should and do support, so just be aware of that, that meeting. Is it possible to get a little bit more detail on the field tennis court and pickleball subcommittee? What's happening, and uh, I, I appreciate the update in the um, in the packet, but I'd be interested to know what the next steps are. Okay. Do one one members want to discuss? We we met uh, to discuss the schedule of a, 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 a proposed schedule uh, for pickleball and. Uh, working with the community to uh, set up, uh, Ad Adam Howard has set up some, some milestones, uh, outreach to the pickleball community, outreach to tennis. Uh, there is a kind of a, a sketch of a plan moving forward. It's, it's not really fleshed out uh, at, at this point to be able to uh, communicate, uh, but I, I see it's on, it's, it is on the agenda for the December meeting, so we're aiming to have uh, the details worked out and then come to the, the full commission at, at that point in time. I don't know if you're, if you have more specific questions. Uh, th th this well, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly just interested in the timing. I'm, I know that we've all spoken about, you know, this is something that if possible, we want to move upon quickly. And I, I don't think it's probably a timing issue on our side, but it's now, you know, taken almost the entire year to hopefully have this before the commission in a, a form that we can do something on it. So. That, that's why we're proceeding with these outreach. We, we, can't, we can't bring something to ourselves and then to council without, uh, without having this outreach. And I think Adam's trying very hard to put that together. It's, I don't think there's any lack of, in, of uh, effort, on, particularly on Adam's part. And, and timing was, was definitely discussed and, and cer certainly we're, we're pushing to get things done as quickly as possible. Adam frankly put together what seemed to be a fairly aggressive schedule and and even with that the the end line is is further out than than, than we would, would be hoping I, I i don't remember offhand uh, what, what the target was uh, but it, something uh it, 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 it's gonna be well in well into 2018 certainly i understand your frustration <laughs> things move slow around here but the good news is that pickled people are using the courts uh they're <laughs> there, we're not uh, impeding their enjoyment. 
So I think we have time to do it right and, and do the proper outreach and come back to it. And as long as we um, are still using the parks and they're using the parks, then I think we're happy. And, and, and I think the pickleball community should be confident that uh, this isn't, uh, hasn't fallen off the, the burner plate. Uh, it, it's, it, there is active work being done uh, on this uh, fairly aggressively. So why don't we take an action to be more articulate on, on that sub subcommittee next meeting? Sure. Fair enough. It was not meant as criticism. I'm just the, you know, curious. Sorry, no. Curious, that. Um, okay. So we are the field use pickleball. Uh, in December, we're on the docket for that. Is that a policy change, or is that so? Do we have to bounce that off council, or is that something that we can do ourselves? I don't think at that time it will be a policy change. Um, I, and it's possible we could move this to November, depending on how far we are with um, the important thing before we bring this out, you know, really into the public, we want to have some focused discussions with the tennis players, the groups that use the tennis courts, as well as the pickleball um, users. Um, out of respect for them and the uses, you know, the need for them to use the courts. So um, that's sort of the driving force right now. Um, so it's possible that we might be able to come back in November, but it's really going to be a report on um, the direction that we would like to go with pickleball. Um, and so that would be, it could be November, it could be December, but I don't think at that time we would be necessarily coming with policy language. Um, it would be more a direction of where we're headed. Yeah. I think my preference would be if we can have a short update next month, sure. have a discussion item, agendize it, and then shoot for some type of action in December then. Sure. Do, are you going to have some of the ad hoc committee helping you with the discussions with the tennis players because you guys did a great job on the pool, the aquatics, getting all the different parties together. And I'm assuming you're gonna do the same thing with the tennis players. I don't, I yeah. don't think there's as many groups, but still it's daunting. We are, and yeah, we'll definitely include the ad hoc in those discussions. Mm. The field and tennis court facility use, um, we also need to talk about the lights for the soccer. Oh, oh yeah, so that should, I mean, if they want to get started in February and have a pilot program, then we should be discussing it pretty soon. Um, I, I agree we need to talk about that. And, and, and then another topic for the committee as well as the facility use policy that, that we have direct, directives from council to uh, address uh, oh, yeah. so we have work to do <laughs> and, and and we we have had discussions that uh, keeping these items separate in, in terms of, of actions is, is the appropriate uh, way to go rather than lumping them all in together so as to try and make progress on something mm -hmm. with, without confusing issues but we but we definitely would like to move forward on all of them I think if we have limited time, I think the soccer at, um, at Cumberly, the lights are a higher priority because their schedule is much tighter. And that pickleball lease to have, uh, they're using the, the courts right now. Agreed. Thank you. If you haven't been over to the uh, tennis courts by the Magical Bridge Playground to see the pickleball, it is a, uh, a, a uh, yes. Uh, it is probably the most fastest exploding sport that I've ever seen. They had started out as a few people playing out there, and now it, it's quite a large community. Um, what are the hours for that? Do you know? I, I've seen them out there playing all day long. Oh, so. <laughs> some, some of us have even gone and played, right, Chris? That's right. Um, there, I believe they're Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. um, and the weekends as well. And the weekends as yeah. well. And on Wednesdays, I think they're wrapping up around one o'clock, so earlier, so late morning. It's like ten to one or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. And I can't can't emphasize enough what um, 
was said earlier about the, the noise uh, and needing to be far enough away from the residences. That spot in Mitchell Park is perfect mm -hmm. and you won't find another one in the whole city as perfect as that, as, except maybe El Camino Park. Is so, <laughs> What is the noise? Is the people chattering? Or? No, 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 the, the pop, 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 pop. Yeah. Really? Okay. Okay, so now let's look at um, comments and announcements. Do we have anything? Then we can move on to tentative agenda. I'll, I'll make one, actually. A, okay. uh, we are going to, uh, for this fiscal year, uh, we're going to start pretty soon uh, embarking on a renovation of Bullware Park, oh. uh, which is over by the Fry's mm -hmm. facility. Uh, so we'll be bringing that uh, back to the commission at some point uh, in the next few months to start looking at the and commenting on the design. Um, what about the AT&T property next door? I don't really have, it's kind of out of you my... Because really, my really <laughs> should get that yeah. going well, yeah, so before yeah. you do much planning. For, uh, I think definitely for the community uh, meeting purposes, I will have to have, I think, a, a pretty solidified answer because that's probably going to be one of the major questions that are going to be asked as we uh, uh, look at the renovation of the actual park that's uh, there adjacent to it. So uh, I don't have an answer for that now, but uh, uh, I will be uh, delving more into that with staff to see uh, where we're at with that. I don't know, yeah. Kristen, if you have anything to add with that. Um, um, there are many stakeholder groups, not many, but the Ventura neighborhood and the Palo Alto, uh, friends of the Palo Alto Park, who would love to be involved and help you push. But we haven't gotten much guidance about how to, how to do that. And so if there's some way that we can push from the outside, can you let us know? Do we have any, they had, last I heard, they had not even desi uh, divided the property yet. Is that, have you heard anything update? I haven't heard any updates. I know they had, I believe they've submitted their application for the lot line adjustment. Um, I can talk to our um, real estate department and I'll let you all know what the status is of that property. Okay, so November. I have one other announcement. Okay. Um, I would like to just recognize Tanya. She um, has taken a, a job somewhere else, and so she'll be leaving us. Um, but I did want to say uh, um, thank you to Tanya for all your help with the Parks and Rec Commission and getting up to speed and all your support. So it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> and thanks for ordering the name tags, too. <laughs> Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. This is your last meeting then. They really should bought her an orchid or something like they do for the outgoing yes. commissioners. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, Thank you. Oh. So you'll be up here, you'll be out with Herb every, every month. <laughs> we'll miss you. We just got you trained in and now we have to, who's gonna be taking over, do we know yet? Um, we don't know yet. I'm. It's possible you'll see Catherine's face back here oh. <laughs> um, filling in until um, we have a replacement, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, we thank you, you've done a wonderful job. We'll miss you, good luck. Okay. I don't, I don't think of it as we got you trained, I think of it as you got <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so November 28th, which is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, uh, park dedication activities prohibited, Buckeye Creek. This is not a PIO for Buckeye Creek. This is just a status. I believe it's just a status update. And then the information update for Baylands Boardwalk. And then, oh, so dog park PIO, I understand that. What does and rules mean? So there's a desire to have some dog park rules um, for each of the dog parks, such as how many dogs you can bring, um, and yeah. maybe the ad hoc can help with there the others. There are presently rules for 
dog parks and this is to update them along with um, doing the park improvement ordinance for Pierce Park to dedicate that space for the dog park. Is the concern that people are dog walkers come in with 20 dogs or something? That's or? one concern, yes. Okay, yeah, we need, we need supervision at the park. And there was a case at Mitchell Park where a dog was killed, so we really need to limit the, uh, the number of the dogs that one person can bring in. So. Yep, the uh, proposal that um, the ad hoc and a group of stakeholders looked at was a maximum of three dogs per person. And do people bring their dogs and leave them? No. No. They should not. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in terms of next month's agenda, I think it might be a fairly busy one. Um, with thing, some things that I think that have to be done, one of which is the dog park, um, it sounds as though uh, field use is going to have one or two issues that probably need to be addressed next month. I wonder whether the park dedication agenda item could be postponed perhaps to December or another month. Yeah, we'll, we'll evaluate that, but I agree. I think we may want to bump that, but we'll see. Quite often things get bumped on their own, so we'll keep it there until, until we need it. But yeah, we don't want to <laughs> cram too much of it. Um, okay, and then December we have, oh, so, okay, I'm confused. So the PIO for the long range plan, is there actually a PIO? I thought we, each one does a. When we further uh, develop the West End, which I started to show you the playground okay. aspect of it, we will bring that back at some point to get a PIO for it. It probably will mostly be a few months from now though. Uh, okay. But that will be a, a aspect of it, definitely. But that will be a PIO for the West End, not for It'll the It'll be, yeah, for the, basically the limits of the specific boundary of the project. So, uh, which will be hopefully the, the complete West End, but. Okay, but that'll be see. 2018, you think? Yes. Okay. Okay, any, any other suggestions of things we want? Where is the field on the school um, liaison, the school city discussion, presentation? If, oh, where is it? When, when is it going to be on our agenda? Oh, oh. Uh, is that something else? But that, was that going to be at another time? Or? So, <clears throat> yeah, so the, uh, if Stephanie has time, <clears throat> we can bring her back either in November or December to give, it, give that 10-minute spiel she had about uh, sharing. I think that's fine. I think it'll depend on how the, uh, if the November agenda gets really long, we might mm -hmm. postpone to December. So we'll, I'll work with um, the chair to find the best time, but it should be either November or December. Do we have a date confirmed for the December meeting? December 19th, okay. correct, Tanya? Oh, what it says there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is confirmed. Okay, if there's no other changes to the agendas, then we're I down move. to number seven. I move the meeting be adjourned. Okay, do we have a second? Yeah, we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, adjourned.